Hello, welcome everybody. This is our dual perspective session, and this is a really important session because I think that what can happen in any kind of rare disease is that people try to categorize one person's experience as an assumption for others. And with Huntington's disease, that is definitely not true because while people have been gone through diagnosis, they've been families, they've been caregivers, they've been friends, it affects everybody individually in a very, very, very personal way. And so by sharing these perspectives of people who are in the same family structure or supporting each other as partners, you really get to understand how going through the entire process of your awareness and your journey with Huntington's disease can change by each individual person. When looking on the outside, it seems like it should be much more common with what their experiences are. So we're gonna have our group of panelists introduce themselves and the relationships that they all represent are a sibling, daughter, and a partner. And they'll be able to explain their perspectives. And as we flip, we'll do a little bit of a break in between unless we just continue to go through and, and we don't wanna stop, but just allow for a little bit of a break and we're gonna switch it to have a father, another sibling, and then the other set of partners. So it's gonna be a really important discussion. So thank you all very much for being here and for our panelists to uh, sharing their, their very personal journey with Huntington's disease. So I'm gonna start with Mustafa to allow him to introduce himself and then we'll just go down the line. Hi everyone, I'm Mustafa. My mom had Huntington's disease. She started experiencing symptoms when I, when I was about 11 or 12, and she passed away when I was 18. Uh, I currently work on HD research. I'm doing a PhD at the University of Toronto, and sort of my guiding force is, you know, trying to understand what HD is and how we can potentially prevent it. Hi everyone, my name's Charlotte. Um, I'm a HDO ambassador. I'm 25, I'm from the northeast of England, and my mum has HD, she's here today. Um, and my nan also had HD as well. She passed away December 2021. Um, I actually received my positive result just two weeks ago. Um, so this is a very new space for me to be um, talking in. I have talked about being at risk before. Um, but yeah, so bear with, <laughs> bear with me if, I, if it becomes a little bit difficult. Um, I'm not yet symptomatic, and I do have a younger sister who's also at risk. Um, yeah, that's me. Uh, my name is uh, Josephine, and I'm from uh, Sweden. Um, I got uh, diagnosed uh, gene positive almost three years ago, and um, my dad has it. Start just now, uh, starting to show symptoms, and. Um, yeah, I'm here with my partner, and we're gonna share our experience. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to add, I was kind of nervous. <laughs> uh, but I'm at risk, uh, yeah, so I haven't been through the genetic testing process. So it's really important for people to understand that the journey begins with Huntington's disease when you first hear about it, and that happens at a variety of different times in one's life based off of your own circumstances. And I'll let you all decide who wants to go first with answering these. So when, can you tell us about the first time that you heard about Huntington's disease in your family? Do you need to go first? Uh, so I've never really known a life without Huntington's disease, if I'm honest. Um, there's always been somebody in my family who's been affected from pretty much birth. Um, so I've always been aware that people have been unwell, but I suppose, became aware that my nana, my maternal nana, um, was unwell, probably around five or six. Um, you know, she was very, quite visibly symptomatic. She used to take us to school. Um, she used to take us everywhere, to be honest. She, we were best friends. Um, and then I suppose when I was about 11 or 12, when I was probably of an age where I would understand things a little bit more, my mum and dad had a conversation, a very open and honest conversation with me about what HD meant, um, but didn't necessarily go into like the scary detail about the risk. Um, and then I suppose as I got older, um, we had that conversation. Um, that I think that open the openness and honest honesty of my parents has really helped me pro 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 process the disease. Um, and I do think it's helped. I like I don't know if you can ever really have a healthy relationship with Huntington's disease, but I do think it's it's really helped how I view the disease and how I've kind of combated it or fought it um, in different stages of my life. So I'm very grateful for that. 
um, and yeah, I suppose became active in the community around four or five years ago. Um, I was still at risk at that point, but my nan was very unwell at the time, um, and I just really felt quite powerless, um, and I really felt like I needed to take control back. Um, so I started fundraising for a charity in the UK, and then through that kind of found HDO and became an ambassador. So yeah, that's my how I learned about HD. Who wants to go next? I'll go next. Okay. So my experiences were actually completely opposite to you. I did not know about HD till I was 14. So I'll answer this question about how I first learned about HD in two parts. One, I'll talk about you know what it was like before I knew about it, and one was like when I first found out about it and what I did then. So before I actually knew what HD was, I, my mother was ex exhibiting symptoms already. So when I was younger, I used to always wonder why my mom couldn't be normal. Like why couldn't she, why couldn't she be like other people who came to pick up their kids from school? Because I didn't understand what was going on either. Um, it's really funny how I actually found out about how HD runs in the family. I was actually watching an episode of House MD. So one of the characters in House MD actually had Huntington's disease. And when I compared the symptoms, I was like, hey, this looks pretty similar to what my mom had. And then I confronted my dad and my uncle. Uh, so HD runs on the maternal side of my family. And they confirmed you know, that, yeah, HD does indeed run in the family. So culturally speaking, I grew up in Pakistan, but nobody really talks about diseases. You know, it's kind of like a hush-hush topic. There's a lot of stigma around it. And growing up, I really felt that, you know, it was something to be ashamed of. You were supposed to be ashamed that your mom had HD. But, you know, as you learn more about it, it's just a disease, you know, it's, it's an illness, nothing more than that. Yeah, so um, I, just like you, never uh, had a life without Huntington. Uh, because my, my dad's mom um, had it uh, when I was uh, young. Uh, and um, she was uh, very, very sick uh, all my all my uh, teenage years, and I tried to ignore it uh, very much, uh, because that was the way we used to do it in our family. Uh, my dad never uh, spoke of it, and um, he still doesn't really speak of it, uh, and. Um, that's that's very sad. So that's why I, I'm doing the complete opposite. I'm uh, advocating instead, because uh, I uh, I need uh, somebody. No, I want people to have support that I needed uh, when I was uh, young and when I was a teenager because uh, it's uh, learning about the disease and everything around it now it's um it's very it's not it's not a nice disease at all <laughs> uh, and um they never really talked about it at all um and the, every time they talked about the disease and uh, my grandma it was all negative stuff um and uh, everything my granddad did wrong in the relationship so yeah yeah I had something similar so one we didn't know that issue ran in the family and the second the way our elders or the elders in my family dealt, it, dealt with it was similar to you where it was very negative um, actually their perception of HD was completely wrong as well so they thought that if one sibling got it the other wouldn't and there was also this myth or like there's the superstition that if you were born on an even number date, you wouldn't get HD. So th those were the things that I grew up being told when I, after, even after I learned about HD that it runs in the family. And we had um, everybody talking about if you're a girl or a boy. Uh, so I always thought that, yay, I'm a girl, I'm gonna have it. So. It was the opposite for me, so like. <laughs> Uh, so for context, my mom and two of her sisters had HD. So my aunts and my mom had HD, but my uncle didn't have HD. So it was like the opposite, where the boys were okay, but the girls were, you know, at risk. <laughs> Can I just add to, so when I say that my family, like I've never known a life without HD, we actually only found out about HD after me and my sister were born. So I think in the last session, we taught, there was a question around whether you can be, somebody can be diagnosed with HD 
at, at, during a post-mortem. My great nana was actually well, passed away and had like suspected Alzheimer's and they kind of said Parkinson's, etc. Um, and they diagnosed HD after she died. So that's when in 2002, um, my nana and my mum at the time got tested and found out they had HD. So I always knew she was unwell and obviously it was HD, um, but I, we never really knew about it. So, yeah. How has Huntington's disease impacted your daily life? <laughs> I mean, from every decision I've made ever, it's pretty much, I've always considered HD as a factor. You know, the decision, gave, it gave me a purpose as well, because when I found out about HD before that, I was kind of lost about what I wanted to actually do with my life. So once I found out about it, I was like, okay, you know, I have, I'll probably have to deal with HD for the rest of my life. Might as well try to have some impact, a positive impact in the world about it. So that's basically my um, story about how I got involved in HD work in research in general. Yeah. Um, Sorry, the question. How has it impacted your daily life? Okay, my daily life. Um, so, um, after I get tested uh, positive, you have the, um, uh, yeah, the, the depression era, I suppose, uh, declining. And then uh, when you see some kind of positivity again, you, you really try to capture those small moments in, in life and trying to be more present. And um, I try to do stuff uh, with more ease, I suppose you can say. Uh, at work, I'm trying to be more um, open. And uh, uh, I, when, w when my coworkers are uh, complaining about something, I can say, well, at least we can walk. Uh, trying to put a positive mindset at uh, things. And um, it's not easy at all. Uh, at times, um, it's, uh, it's very hard. And that's why I'm very, very thankful for my partner and what uh, he does for me. Yeah. So again, like the guys, um, I, th I suppose HD impacts every area of your life, especially when you know, you've got multiple family members impacted. And I think the way that HD's impacted my life has changed as my life has progressed. So obviously, um, you know, when I was a, a young person impacted by the disease, um, you know, I would go to school, but I had a really good relationship with my nana at the time. And, you know, I would go, go and see her after school and I learned to cook and clean at, you know, 12, 13 years old. And I never told any of my friends at the time that I was walking down the hill to her apartment and go in and making sure she was okay and going shopping with her and you d it's not something that I spoke about it's just something I kind of did I didn't think about it um I just kind of it was just an instinct kind of thing I suppose um and then uh, as her disease progressed she went into a nursing home um and obviously you know they kind of took over the the care um but still went every day I used to camp out in the nursing home take a duvet um, I'm still really good friends with all of her carers and the, the home manager as well. I've had a really good relationship with them. Um, and when COVID hit, um, the nursing home closed and like my whole world was, I didn't know what to do. I was like, blim neck, like, don't know, you know, what am I going to do without seeing her now? Um, so I had a really good, as I said, had a really good relationship with the home manager. And I said, look, how can I get in? Um, and she said, look, we're looking for bank staff, um, so come and work on a weekend. So I did. Um, I worked my Monday to Friday job, and I went in on a weekend and worked Saturday, Sunday, and worked 12-hour shifts, but it was the best thing I ever did um, because I got to see her. It was only for like an hour on my lunch break, but I got to see her, um, and then she died that year, actually. So it was, yeah, so glad I did that. Um, so I, I suppose it's impacted me in that respect because that experience was life-changing. Um, I don't know if anybody, a lot of people will have probably have experience of care facilities, but the work that they do is incredible um, and it, they work so hard. Um, but yeah, so, and I suppose at present day, my mum obviously is, her degrees, I can see her now, her <laughs> disease is progressing um, and that's really hard. And I think everybody was impacted by HD experience that, anticipatory grief and you're always grieving something you know if you're not grieving the your the 
anticipate with grief, it's you're grieving the loss of a loved one, or you're grieving your own life as well, because even if you're not, you know, gene positive, there's a lot that you can, you know, there's a lot you lose from a life impacted by HD. Um, so I think that's a really important point to say. And obviously, with my positive result, that's a completely different impact and something that I've had to work through these past two weeks. Um, it's been very strange. I think I'm probably <laughs> still in shock, if I'm honest. Um, I did go into the appointment kind of knowing that what they were going to say. Um, I knew I'd been seeing my genetic counsellor for seven years. Um, so again, like the last session when people were saying, you know, you, you know, when you go in, it was completely different for me. I went in at 18, I said, I want to be tested. And my genetic counsellor was like, do you really? And that process actually really helped me realise that it wasn't the right time for me. Um, and I went to see her every year for seven years. And then I woke up one day and I was like, this is it. Like, I know now I'm at peace with the decision. And I felt really good about it. Um, and yeah, and I feel, to be honest, I feel not good about my positive result because like I would have wished for a negative result, obviously. Um, but I feel okay, like I'm okay with that and the impact that it's gonna have on my life. And it's like, like you say, it's really, it's not easy. And I think, you know, a, a lot of advocates here at the Congress are outwardly quite positive, um, but that doesn't come easy. Like some days it's, you know, it is hard to be positive sometimes. Um, but I think it's important that we do, like, well, I always say, like you say, when you're encouraging your co-workers to look at what we can walk, there's always something to be grateful for and something to be positive about. So that's kind of the mindset that I try to have. That's really cool. Yeah, so speaking about my own experiences, I really resonated with the fact that as you grow older, you sort of wear different hats. Like when I was younger, uh, I was sort of more of a caregiver role where since I was the eldest uh, son, especially in like uh, the country I come from, there's a lot, lot of responsibility attached to being that. So transitioning from that role, I really did not want that role at all. So I wanted to run away from home multiple times, you know, because I didn't want to deal with the things that were happening around me. Um, and then as you grow older, you realize that, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is, you know, I have to be there for my siblings, for, you know, the wider community in general as well. So now as you grow older, sort of have these transitioning roles and you're experiencing experience with HD ch changes. In terms of like genetic testing, I was always at risk. I never got tested because in my country there was like no facilities, no support of the people around us. Like when you have a lack of knowledge, there's generally not a lot you can do for HD families anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, I had one more thing to add. Yeah, so genetic testing, like I never considered genetic testing for myself because when I never had access, but even when I did have access, when I grew up or when I was growing up, I always thought that personally I would get HD for sure. Like I've had multiple nights where I've been symptom, symptom hunting and you know, for sure I thought I would get HD and you know, I wouldn't make it beyond the age of 30. And you know, so transitioning from that, coming out of it, it's, it's a really hard task and it takes a lot of courage and I'm really happy you went through that process and you're at peace with it now. Just so proud of you all, and this is such a great, sorry, I'm getting teary-eyed. Uh, HD is obviously, as, as this session is really about, affects your relationships in all aspects. So when we say affect, that can mean good, bad, just different. So how has it changed your relationships that you have? Uh, well, we, we uh, they spoke about it uh, earlier. Uh, Kelly did with the different uh, relationships uh, that you have uh, and what they give you. Uh, and uh, I have a lot of support uh, in my family, uh, f for sure. My sister, she's uh, tested negative, so um, we went uh, almost at the same time uh, tested uh, and. Uh, Always included my mom and dad in the um, in the part of uh, our testing. Um, telling dad was uh, the hardest thing ever because um, I know um, I knew that he would blame himself uh, for everything. Um, but uh, being uh, distant now and um, looking back, I think. 
I should have, I should have had my had my mom more in the, in my in my mind when I told her, because uh, because uh, her everything she's going through and has gone through and are going to continue to have go go through uh, with me. Um, it's uh, it's a lot to take in and um that's um that's why i'm uh, very thankful for again my partner because um, i see how my mom and dad are together and what they are talking about and not talking about mm -hmm. the the commu communication uh, part of uh, of it all uh, and uh, we are almost overly sharing um we talk about everything um and uh, it's been like that from from the start i think uh, uh, we talked about um um how many dates you've been through before telling your partner um and i was counting and you don't really do the date stuff in in Sweden uh, it's like <laughs> you, you meet you okay uh, let's get together okay so <laughs> so I think um, when when uh, we were four months in our relationship uh, we uh, we thought uh, it was going to be more serious and then uh, I've just, I just told him, and uh, it was uh, like 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 nothing. So um, he he's gonna speak later, but he's been uh, through a lot in his life. So me being uh, at risk at the time um, wasn't really uh, it it wasn't a big big deal cuz um uh yeah his mom was sick uh, with something else uh so um he was just like but well you 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 are you you are still going to be you um and we have uh, um a lot of time together and that's something that you have uh, reinsured me with uh, over the time and that's we have something that my dad doesn't have and that's time uh, and uh, i when i have my dark uh, uh, more dark days um that's uh, a sentence i'm repeating to myself at least we have time uh, on our hands and i'm i need to focus on that because i i can't uh, think of uh, um, being sick yeah uh, i never saw myself being old and uh, when I got the diagnosis, it was like uh, getting uh, a reassurance that, yep, you're never going, going to get old. So um, having the opportunity to, to commun communicate with your partner and having an open relationship in that way, uh, it's been very, very um, grateful for, for, for me and uh i hope uh, i hope uh, you all have good partners <laughs> so yeah um so again a little bit like my previous answer um my relationships have been ever changing with hd so i've obviously had different like, relationships with different groups of people um whilst i've been impacted um but i think i suppose if i reflect on the last few weeks in terms of the how my relationships have changed since I've become positive again. My mum was the hardest person to tell. Um, and I think for me, that was the hardest part of the whole day. Um, even when they said, you know, my genetic counsellor told me I was positive and I think she probably thought there was something wrong with me when I didn't cry. Um, you know, I said, that's fine. Like, this is, this is the card I've been dealt. You know, I'm just really sad for my mum. Um, and again, I think you, you do, you often do think of others in that process because it's hard not to. Um, but I think it, it's been hard watching my loved ones almost grieve for my life um, or the life that I've 
had in, my, in mind. Um, and that's been really weird. Like I've no, I don't think there's any other situation in life where people cry. Well, obviously, I think when you lose someone, but I, it's just very surreal when people are crying for you and you're kind of stood there like, oh, okay, like this is really happening. It's, it is quite strange. Um, but I didn't actually tell my mum I was going through the testing process at all, which was really hard. Um, me and my mum were inseparable, so um, yeah, and she knew something wasn't right. And um, when I told her, she said I knew there was, she didn't know what was happening, I don't think, but she knew this was something I wasn't telling her. I told my dad, which was probably very hard for him to keep from my mum as well. Um, didn't tell my sister, um, but I told a few of my friends and they were really supportive. Um, and I was, I was quite surprised actually, not, my friends are amazing, but I was really surprised at how much people really did like put their arms around me and, you know, were really there for me. It was, it was really good. Um, I suppose if, if I think back growing up and like, I don't want this to sound negative and again, I've got an amazing relationship with my mum now but there has been times that the disease has impacted my relationship with my mum. You know, you know, she, there's been points where she's really not been well. Um, and, you know, I've been, I don't know if you can use the word victim, but I've been victim to that. Um, and she won't mind me saying that because it's something we've worked through. Um, but I think that's a big thing for young people impacted or have, you know, family members. We do have to manage those um, emotions and symptoms and relationships as well. Um, and I think growing up, I, people, the more I was open with people, so I shared my story, I think, first time when I was 18. I did a skydive as soon as I was old enough. Um, so I was like, what's, like, what can you do? I Googled, what can you do when you're 18? And they, it said skydive. <laughs> so I was like, yes, that's it, I'll do that. Um, my mum was absolutely pooping her pants. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't, haven't made it much worse as I've got older, I've just climbed Kilimanjaro. Um, so yeah, but, um, and I did share our family story from that point. So like everybody who's been in my life from that point knows about HD. Um, and they know, my friends know, you know, I might cancel plans or there's been times where my nan, you know, somebody spoke about, it, I think in one of the sessions I was in before about, um, you know, how her mum, um, waited to go to the toilet. Um, until she was there and there was like a te full team of carers and, and I used to get calls all the time when I was at uni and they'd be like your nan won't do this when you come and I'd go and she'd do it straight away but it's almost and that was like a joke and it was like she found that really funny that like I'd rush to her aid and then she'd be like haha like here you are like <laughs> Um, but it was just, yeah, it was just a thing. Um, and they, so my friends knew, like, I would need to cancel things at the drop of a hat, um, and that was fine. And I think they've been great with that. And I found being open as really that being vulnerable with people has allowed them to understand as well. And I think it's hard for people to understand if if there isn't that there. And I know it's hard. Um, again, I know you've touched on um, your partner. My partner isn't here this weekend, but um, I can't say enough good words about him, he's incredible. Um, I didn't actually wait, like, um, I think I told him about two weeks into it, I was even texting, um, because I, it was all over my social media at the time, I was doing like a fundraising event and it was pretty hard to hide, but again, a bit like you, he was like, well, you know, he barely even knew me, so hats off to him. Um, he was like, yeah, well, that, why is that an issue? And he's been like that all the way through. Um, he supported with my nan's personal care when there wasn't carers available. Like, he's just incredible. Um, and I know he'll do the same for my mum as well. So, yeah, um, I think the message is vulnerability is, is hard, but it really helps um, relationships and really helps that deeper connection. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I was like you, so I told my current partner like literally a week after meeting her, and like, I'm surprised she didn't run away. <laughs> yeah. I also think like when it comes to partners or relationship with partners, for me, having been in previous relationships where they didn't really understand what she was, that was a really difficult thing for me. Because when I was when I would talk about dealing with my mom, they didn't really understand and wouldn't really know how to help, which was not their fault actually. So when I met my current partner and her having her own history of trauma and stuff, she knew exactly where I was coming from. And I felt really supportive in that sense as well. But that's not the case for every partner. Um, I think the biggest relationship that was impacted in my life due to HD was actually with my father. 
So when my mom got HD, my father, um, he didn't know anything about HD, so he went the opposite way, where instead of bringing the family together, he sort of didn't want to deal with it either, like when I was, when I was younger. And he sort of like went out and about, you know, went out with other women and things like that. Um, so the primary, so you have four young kids at home, your dad is out of the picture basically, and your mom is, you know, in the ravages of Huntington's disease. It's not really an easy environment to grow up in. So you have to grow up really quickly, and that really affected my relationship with my father, where I blamed him for a lot of things. But now I understand that you know, he was going through his own process, you know, and everyone makes their own decisions, whether they're right or wrong, it's up to them, but they have to live with the consequences sort of. Um, so yeah, that was basically the biggest relationship that I had impacted by HD. And basically I was like, I don't wanna be that guy. I will be there for people who have HD, who need me, and you know, basically be a, a pillar of support for them if they do trust me enough. And I really like that you mentioned vulnerability because that's helped me as well. Because before I didn't really want to talk about HD a lot when I was younger, but as soon as I started opening up to like family members or parents <laughs> or you know, like um, partners, it really helped realize what I thought about it and what I wanted to do about it as well. So last question and, and we're a little over time, which is totally fine because we have that cushion, so don't worry about it, but let's do this in maybe just a, a couple of sentences each just to allow for a break because I know that the session is can be really heavy, so I think it's that's going to be important. Um, how do you stay positive? I can go first. It's really, really hard for me personally. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of days where I've been super cynical about the world and the situation I was in, but I think the biggest thing that personally helped me was actually going to therapy and having that talking out about why I feel that way, processing my past trauma, sort of coming out a better person for it. So like on my best days, I'm positive about it. I'm taking risks. Okay, you know, I can do this science, for example, in my work. I can do this. I, I can actually have an impact in the world. And my, on my worst days, I really doubt myself about having, you know, that impact, whether I can actually help them, people. So I think the message from me would be how to stay positive. It's like surround yourself with people who care about you, you know, who will be there for you to discuss when you're down, to work through your feelings, and I guess get a therapist. <laughs> that would be my advice. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, how to stay positive. Um, again, uh, surround you yourself um, with people that you enjoy spending time with. Um, I don't have time for um, platonic relationships. It it doesn't give us uh, anything uh, special. And um, maybe um, do <laughs> something we, we talked about is doing stuff more more earlier and not um, um, saying we will do it later and staying positive in the in the process of uh, just being here and now uh, and together and um, uh, yeah that's it I think I suppose it's probably going to be quite similar to your guys' answers, um, but my big thing is don't do it alone. Um, I think no, no matter at what point or how you're impacted by HD, like, I mean, my dad obviously is going to speak, um, and I've said this to him throughout, and I've encouraged him to reach out about my own diagnosis, um, but, pl like, please don't do it alone. They're, like, you guarantee there will be someone who cares and who really wants to listen, um, and I've learned that, and I've, like... I don't know, it, it's it's just been life changing. And again, being involved with HDO, you, if you're not comfortable in being really open and honest about your story, um, just tell someone you're struggling, you know? And I know that's really hard and it, 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 and it depends on where you're from. And, you know, it's just, it's just really helped me on my journey. Um, and another thing, and again, I know this isn't, it might sound morbid, but I think when um, I was caring for my nan in her final stages and she seemed to be in the final stage for a long time. Um, it was about five, six years. She was, you know, bound her bed and, you know, there was, she was really unwell. And I used to think, you know, you're, 
we used, I used to tell the, her carers stories about her life. So she lived in Kenya when she was younger and she, you know, and I used to project her life for her. And I, I often think, what will people say about, about my life? Like, I want people to have like really good talk, stories to tell about my life. I want them to say, you know, she lived really well. She did this, she did this and not like, or the, the disease kind of took hold and, you know, took control of everything because it will take control of some things, but there's definitely control that we have. Um, and reach out on tough days, that's a, a big one. Um, on the days that you can't be positive, and there will be days that, that you can't be positive, you know, lean on other people. Yeah, just echoing that really, it's like, for example, when you feel like you have no one around, what do you do? Like, who do you, who do you trust? Like when you're in a situation where one of your parents has HD, and the other one is really not in the picture. You know, your entire life should, your younger life is based around your parents. So you can reach out to friends. Um, what I did actually was actually, I emailed HTYO <laughs> when I was, what, 16, and I got a really good reply from Maddie. She's waving my hand. And it, it was super helpful to know that there were other people out there as well who were impacted by the disease. Because when I grew up in Pakistan, nobody really was talking about the disease. Nobody really did understand what it was. So for me, it was important to realize that, okay, there are other people like me out there, and I can also potentially have an impact in the world. So thanks for that, Maddie. I still have that email. <laughs> I just want uh, <laughs> I just want to add something uh, that my partner said to me, uh, and that's um, when we had a discussion about, uh, is it worth it, um, this disease, our, our life? Um, and uh, he said, if I wanted, I would have leave you already. It's not because of the disease at all. Uh, it doesn't impact me uh, the way you think. So stop worrying about that. And that's that's oh, love for me. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> So um, something that I do every day is, um, and I know uh, Dr. Bonnie might put touch on it, but um, I pra practice gratitude and I really try to make it very specific to the day that I've had. Um, me and my partner often have a bit of a laugh because we do it together at the dinner table and I say, three things you're grateful for today. And he's like, my health. And I'm like, no, three things from today. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, we don't think about things specifically enough. Like so often we sit and think, oh yeah, I'm grateful for my health, I'm grateful for my family. But actually like what's happened that day that you can really smile about and you can really um, take away. And it's, it's really empowering. Like it's, you know, it's something so small and might seem insignificant, but actually you think you're like, oh yeah. Like even if you've had the worst day ever, you're like, this is actually not been that bad. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's just something that's really quick and easy to do. I think it's easy to get in your head about the future and many, many, many years down the line. And that's that's great advice because you can narrow yourself in, you can bring yourself back because there are things out of your control, but you can control what's happening today and now. And that's a really important message. And just to echo a lot of what people said is that it can feel very lonesome in your journey, but I, I hope, and, and everybody's been saying this, but I hope it continues to be felt is that when you leave here tomorrow or Monday that you don't feel that way. And that's not to say that you won't have lonely moments or times when you feel like you can't reach out, but you can. So please do. I get yelled at all the time. So even if you need to say, Jenna, can we talk? And I just want to scream at you. I'll say, OK. <laughs> Because sometimes that's just helpful to do. So please reach out to us, reach out to friends, reach out to your local associations, whatever it is, you have a family of here to support. And I'm and I, and I am so appreciative for you three to share this. It's not easy to do this. It is hard, it is emotional, but this community is very special and there are a lot of positive things to take away because it has connected us all. So let's take a break. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists.